Um, the work that we have to do at the end of this war against COVID, this final battle, is really about getting folks, convincing folks that they should get vaccinated. The supply has exceeded demand. Only about 50% of our appointments, our health department appointments were filled this last week. So really this is all about filling appointments. And um, the uh, Dr. Kalyana Raman will talk about some of the initiatives that the health department is doing to move us forward, um, make, make it easier for folks, convince folks that they should be getting, getting vaccinated. But I just wanna mention a couple of those. Um, first, I'm thrilled that our school system, Anne Arundel County Public Schools and the health department have gotten together on a vaccination program for students. And so there will be three Wednesdays coming up, the 12th, the 19th, and the 26th of May, when students uh, age 16 and older will be able to get vaccinations at high schools um, by appointment. And those, those parents, those families will be notified um, with the link to be able to sign up for those for those appointments. So that's great news. I hope our young people um, are wiser than some of the rest of us and will show us how important it is to get vaccinated and take advantage of the opportunity. Um, the other big one that I want to mention is the grant program uh, for our health ambassadors. And this is federal money that came through the state. And we are awarding to nine organizations in the county $700,000 to get out there in communities, in the communities that have the lowest vaccination rates, but the greatest COVID impact, where, where more people have been infected, more people have died, more people work low wage jobs and front frontline jobs, uh, more people of color. And the organizations that we've selected to do this work, um, some of it is door knocking direct to, to neighborhoods. Some of it is out at places where people gather. But the organizations that we have, have selected are trusted in the community and will be doing a lot of hard work in the coming weeks to increase our vaccination rates in those, in those zip codes in particular. Um, plan 2040 passed last night our general development plan for Anne Arundel County. And that is a, a victory for, I think, the residents of the county. It's something that um, one of the reasons why I ran for this office is I knew that this was coming up and that we needed to um, shift the focus in this county to smart growth, get back to smart growth principles, and also put more power into the hands of communities in land use decision making. and. For those of, of us who remember the small area plans that communities did um, um, back in the early 2000s and the way that those plans were, were not really part of the rezoning process um, and the, the rezonings that took place after that and how that all happened, um, we knew that we needed to fix that problem. And so we have empowered communities with regional plans and comprehensive rezoning will come after that. And I think that's the biggest the biggest victory in this plan 2040. So I wanna thank uh, the council for doing the hard work. I know there were 116 amendments that passed. Uh, the, the seven council members worked with one another, supporting each other's amendments. We did not support all of them, particularly the ones that changed the land use map uh, to, to reflect um, what somebody's future goal is versus what the current land uses are. Um, we wanna give that power to the regions, uh, the communities. Um, but um, I, I thank the council for, for passing the plan. It was a little bit of a wake up call that, that many of us were surprised that it was not a 7-0 vote. We thought that everybody had worked together and it would be um, all three Republicans voted against the plan. And, and I hope that this council and our administration can continue to work with the three Republicans so that we can, can get their votes on important legislation. And that's how we can do better than the US Congress. And even though there is an election coming up in a year and a half, I think we can, we can work together to solve this county's problems. And I look forward to doing that. Um, there was another bill that, that uh, did not pass that I believe has to come back, did not pass last night which was the, the bill to address the illegal tree clearing that takes place before uh, developers have actually applied for their, their subdivision applications. And we've seen enough examples of this. We know who they are and, and when they took place that we know we have to close this loophole in Anne Arundel County to, to have real consequences when that happens. So I know that the council wants to close this loophole. We will go back and we will get this right and get this done. I'm confident of that. And then finally, I just want to, um, um, remind people that tonight is our 
uh, Tuesday night with the county executive, the topic being body worn cameras. I will have our police chief, Mal Awood, with me um, and the team that has been working on this program. Um, we've notified all of the 335 young people who really made this program happen, um, who emailed their council members and me and said, we need to do this uh, a little over a year ago. And I hope that a lot of those young people show up to, to, um, to see what this program is all about and how it's gonna work. Um, I think it's gonna improve transparency and trust uh, with uh, between community and police. So um, with that, I'll turn it back. Uh, I guess I'm passing it on to Dr. Kalyan Arana. Thank you, County Executive. Um, I'll start with the data. We're seeing an improvement in our situation. We're seeing that our cases are decreasing. Um, our testing volume is, is steady. And so along with that means that our percent positivity is coming down. Um, and most importantly, our hospitalizations are coming down. So what we're seeing is that our case rate is down to 13 um, and was 18 last week. Um, in, in the hospitals combined between the two hospitals, um, census is just under 60, uh, which is really nice to see. Um, and then our percent positivity is 5.3 this week, uh, sorry, last week compared to 6.4 two weeks ago. Um, so all in all, uh, our measures are heading in the right direction. As we talked about, that's a combination of vaccinations and the end of cold and flu season. And I think it's really important to emphasize that what we're seeing, particularly now with a full year's worth of data, is that there is, um, for COVID-19, there is a correlation to cold and flu season. We see the, the increases during the fall and um, winter time, and we saw, like we did last summer, a decrease in rates. It doesn't mean that it goes away, though. It's still circulating, just at lower levels. Um, and so it's important for us to really push on the vaccinations, as the county executive mentioned. We're really pushing hard on that. Right now, we've had 46% of the population get at least one dose, and that amounts to 59% of adults over the age of 18. Um, so that means we still got 41% of those adults left to go. And so we're really going to be pushing hard on that. Um, number of things that we're doing, all of the health department clinics um, will now be walk-in availability at all of them at all hours. Um, and we're doing that in part because because what we saw last week is that only about 50 to 60% of the appointments we had were filled. Now that's different um, than any other week we've had before where appointments were fully filled. Um, and so that's showing us that there's a decrease in the, in the demand for this, but we're not done, right? We need to see those folks vaccinated. So we're gonna have walk-in availability. We're promoting high school students to get vaccinated and that's why we have 16 plus clinics in addition, of course, the partnership with AACPS that the county executive met, where we'll be holding clinics at high schools over the next three weeks um, to provide increased access and, and uh, targeted uh, appointments for our high school students. We'll have increased evening and weekend hours. We're gonna be continuing our partnership with libraries. That's been a fantastic partnership um, in getting into the community. But we're also gonna make available more doses that go to our community vaccine uh, vaccine sites. Probably most importantly is our, is our health ambassador program. Uh, as the county executive mentioned, we have nine uh, organizations that we're funding. They span the entire county. Um, and they're really focused on doing a, a number of really uh, community-based uh, uh, outreach events. So door-to-door, -door, working community centers, houses of faith, businesses. Um, the key to this is that these are, these are trusted community organizations that are doing the work in their communities to reach out to those who need, in, need, uh, need that type of outreach to get them vaccinated. And so that's looking at uh, black communities, Hispanic, low-income areas, and older individuals. Those are the folks who've been hit hardest during this pandemic. And I've also lagged for any number of reasons in terms of vaccinations. And so access is really the key to making sure that we are getting vaccines into, into their arms. Um, as part of our equity push, we wanted to share our data around that. Last week, um, blacks accounted for 16.6% of, of those vaccinated, Hispanics 9.5%. So we've seen some um, significant gains that over the past number of weeks that have held 
uh, and we are going to continue to uh, put our efforts into reaching those underserved uh, groups and make sure they get vaccinated. Right now, over 84% of people over the age of 65 have gotten at least one dose, and we want to keep pushing that uh, pushing that number up. Um, one of the, the last thing I want to talk about was mental health. The, May is Mental Health Month, and in particular, May 7th is National Children's Mental Health Awareness Day. Um, we've talked about that a bit. Mental health is essential to everyone's overall health and well-being, and mental illnesses are common and treatable. Um, so while one in five people will experience mental illness during their lifetime, um, we know that everyone faces challenges in their life, and we've seen that particularly during COVID, and we are talking about the impact of coming out of COVID and how people readjust and also compensate for what happened during the uh, during kind of the worst months of this. The Department of Health and the Mental Health Agency work together to provide free or low-cost behavioral health services to adults and to children ages 4 to 18 and families. So it's important to remember that you're not alone. Everybody struggles. Um, and the Mental Health Agency has a warm line, 410-768-5522 to provide immediate assistance, and that's a 24-7 uh, service. So please, we want to just get the message out for people to please reach it to that warm line if they just want to talk to somebody or need uh, need to know about services available to them in the county. With that, I will turn it back over to you, Jeff. All right, and we'll open it up for questions. Again, just as a reminder, please share your name and media affiliation in the chat, and we'll call on folks in order. Hi. Hello, can you hear me? David Collins, WBAL TV. Yep, we got you, David. Oh, thank you. I, I wanted to know if, if Anne Arundel County is going to offer any incentives uh, similar to what other states have been do doing and what Governor Hogan did, announced yesterday $100 for those who can prove they are vaccinated. Any incentives in the offering here? We're talking about it. We're talking about incentives as well as opportunities to participate in things for folks who are vaccinated um, that that others cannot participate in. So that's all under discussion. Could you give us an example, please? Um, well, I personally believe that our senior centers, for instance, are places where we can't afford to have COVID spread, but where folks um, will participate if they feel that others have been vaccinated and that it's safe. And um, so I'm having conversations with our Department of Aging and Disabilities about whether there are activities that could be for folks who are um, are vaccinated um, and have have proof of that. So, but that's, that's um, that all has to be reviewed by a lot of people before we make any announcements, but that's my own, my own view is that, is that um, we would be doing people a, a service by providing some um, vaccinated only activities. All right, next up we've got Rob Lang, WBAL. All right, good morning. Um, the county executive mentioned that um, demand is, uh, or rather supply is outpacing demand for vaccines. And I know yesterday the state fairgrounds um, vaccine site actually closed early because they didn't have enough appointments. Now you're not doing any more appointments the county is not scaling back its vaccine clinics, or is that being considered? At the present time, we're not scaling back our vaccine clinics, but what we are what we are working on is how to increase the number of community vaccine sites that we have to make it easier for people to reach. And then, you know, over the course of the month, um, if we see demand drop there, drop in our, our fixed sites, we will have to change the hours so that we're we're reaching who we need to reach. Sure. What sort of places are you looking at for possible clinics, you know, for possible outreach? So we mentioned the schools, of course. Um, we're working with the libraries. We are talking to businesses and uh, business uh, shop, shopping areas, like shopping malls or strip malls, um, to bring vaccine sites there as well. Thank you. All right. Next up, we've got Rita Rich, WNAV. Hi. Good morning. A uh, couple of questions. First, about men and women in uniform who some have been refusing to get vaccines, fire and police. Do we have any way of knowing how many of Anne Arundel County's fire and police officers have, have actually been vaccinated? And do we have any idea how many are just not doing it? 
we don't have perfect numbers. Um, surveys have been done. Uh, not everybody filled out the surveys. I think that's been reported on. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but we can get them to you from the surveys. That would be good. And you said that you're going to have all clinics become walk-in clinics at all hours. Um, when, when might we see or hear about that? That is in effect as of yesterday. Okay, can you can you also send me a, a list of those walk-in clinics and uh, where they are so I can promote it? So we can we can send you it's it's the list of all of our clinics, but we can send that to you. All right, thank you very much. Next up, Danielle Old Capital. Hi, thank you. Um, a couple quick questions. So we know from local polling, and you know this is also true nationally that one of the most vaccine hesitant groups are Republicans that voted for President Trump. Does the county have any plans to reach these people? I don't believe that, that we are targeting them. Um, we're not targeting them specifically. And, and we're really trying to um, give people the facts about, um, about the vaccines being safe but also sending out the message that we don't want to end back, end up where we were. And I think whether you're a Trump voter or a Biden voter, you don't want the restrictions back in place that we have had in the past. And, and um, so we are encouraging people to act as individuals, but act collectively on behalf of this country and this county to, end this pandemic by doing their individual act of getting vaccinated. Same message for everybody. Thank you. Um, and to pivot a bit, I am actually not sure if if this is a if this has been going on for a while, but has the county resumed, you know, some like in-person functions um, and services like housing inspections and and that kind of thing? Yes. <laughs> um, and I guess, I guess, you know, going item by item, we'd have to have to tell you um, if there are any that are, are, um, are not taking place, but um, I believe, I mean, most of that is taking place. Okay. And our, our inspections and permits folks are out there in the field um, doing their jobs. Gotcha. Thank you. Next up, Joel McCord, WIPR. Uh, Joel, if you're asking your question, you are on mute. I had, there we go. Yeah, this is, uh, as I said, re, uh, started to say, kind of related to Danielle's question, not just Republicans, but is there any special outreach to any folks who are really resistant to, to getting the vaccine? So there is there is specific outreach. Uh, mentioned the the health matter health ambassadors program, but there's also we have a media program that is uh, targeting um, getting information to younger younger folks, um, the Hispanic community uh, and Black community, and we are doing that across digital platforms uh, and through advertising. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you. Case Cook. Hello, uh, I'll make this easy. My question was asked and answered, thank you. All right, moving on, uh, Heather Mangilio, the Capitol. Thanks, so um, just to switch subjects a little bit, um, I know with the Naval Academy commissioning coming up, there um, will be people coming in to watch their uh, midshipmen graduating. Is there any concern that that might result in um, an uptick in our numbers as you have more people from out of state come in? I'll, go, I'll let you answer that, Dr. Taylor. Um, yep. Um, you I know, don't particularly, but. <laughs> I, I was going to say, yeah, you know, not not in any particular way. This is why it's um, important for folks to get vaccinated and to, and to um, you know, we didn't talk about the masking, but 
for people who are outdoors to, if they're not vaccinated, still continue to mask. That's really critical. Um, and if you are vaccinated, to so remember that if you're in, if you're in crowded settings like a, a, a sports event or another crowded outdoor event, you should actually still mask. Um, we're going to see more and more movement of people um, around the around the state and around the country, uh, and our vaccination efforts are really going to make the difference between whether those are those become safer or not. As far as the actual ceremonies, I'm confident that the uh, the Naval Academy is going to have all of the protections and protocols in place to prevent spread. Thank you. All right, next up, Rick Hutzel, the Capitol. And that's the last question I see in the chat. So just a reminder, if anybody has any questions, please put your name and media affiliation in the chat. Rick, over to you. Just a, just a quick shout out to former Capitol reporter, Joel McCord. Um, we, 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 we all, we always, you know, keep you in the family when you work here once, even if it was more than one or two years ago. Um, so, uh, uh this is a question for, uh, Dr. Calderon and I guess the County executive Annapolis, uh, late last month moved back to in-person council meetings, but left the opening of, uh, public meetings where the members of the public can attend, uh, sort of open-ended based on advice from the health department. And Rundle, as you know, is still, I believe, meeting uh, virtually. When might we see a return to public meetings where the public can attend? I don't, well, well, I, I don't have a good answer on that as far as a, a timeline, but I would like to say that um, we need to get back to that. I think some of some of the um, um, the fact that people are not in person testifying at the council and they're not showing up in groups with their shirts and all of the advocacy that groups do uh, before the council, uh, I think has had an impact. And, and I think, um, I also believe that when people are face to face among council members, that their humanity comes out and that people, um, people might come to different conclusions um, when when these these things take place in person. So I'm really looking forward to our council getting back to in-person meetings um, and it's their decision when they do so. Dr. Keller, are, 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 are the metrics there yet? Is it safe to resume public meetings? So they're, they are able to open up to public meetings within the guidelines that are out there. Um, and you, you've seen those guidelines in terms of um, all sorts of businesses and activities can resume with proper precautions in place. So masking being particularly key among them. So that, as the county executive said, it, that's up to the county council to move forward on. And then we are heading into uh, the, the festival season, if you will. Um, you know, I think the barbecue festival, the I think there's actually a chicken wing festival um, and it's everybody's favorite festival. And uh, so what's going to be the use of, in other words, will people who have had vaccinations, should the, let's start that question again. Should these events set vaccinations as part of the criteria for being able to attend? That's a, that's an excellent question. I think that having having vaccinations be a requirement or at least some other evidence that you are not spreading COVID, so such as a negative test, um, would be a really wise move on the part of these events to to really improve the improve the safety for those who are attending and decrease the chances of spread. So are you suggesting that to the organizers of these events? The first mass event I think recently occurred at the uh, county fair grounds um, and they all had masks and everything, but I don't know that they were having any entrance requirements. You know, they're not, they're not required to do that, but that is a, that is an, that is a, um, that is a safety precaution that we are recommending is that either vaccinated or having a, uh, having a negative test. Any plans to make it mandatory? 
right now with the with the vaccine still under emergency use authorization, that is a bit challenging. But as it goes up for formal approval, we are talking about when it would be uh, when it would be mandatory or not to have a vaccination. Thank you very much. All right, seeing no other questions in the chat. Uh, thank you all for joining. We'll see you all next week.